the panel that we um, discussed, I mean, we, uh, we put in the program, the idea is to really to give you some very, um, uh, very practical information about what is available in LA. And the, uh, actually, for biotech entrepreneurs, the whole program has been established exactly to be uh, a, a sort of help for uh, for very young stage early early stage entrepreneurs uh, to uh, get to know about resources and about um, and that's uh, uh, that's why you have uh, exhibitor tables. But you know we also want to uh, put together a few people in in this panel that will um, educate us, you know, on the, what you can find up there and you know what's the status of uh, biotech in LA and how it's funded. So we're very excited to have a very uh, exciting panel. There are a few changes in the, in the program, but you will see the uh, the panel we expect to be very exciting. We'll have uh, uh, some time for Q and A uh, towards the end. So to moderate the panel, panel is uh, Lisa from my team. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm just going to let you know about the changes to the panel today. So unfortunately, Adam Bazi from the Entrepreneur in Residence from Kairos Ventures isn't able to be with us today, but in his place we have somebody just as great, uh, Ari Lippman, uh, who is a known biotech consultant. Um, Alice Jacobs uh, from Third Rock Ventures will also be here to moderate the discussion. And uh, she has a series of questions she will be asking our panelists and asking them for their opinion. Um, we have Andrew Partinsky here, uh, who is the CEO and co-founder of Escola Tech. Um, Amir Nyberg is also here from the U UCLA Tech Development Group. And we also have Carlos Gutierrez uh, from the Larda Institute. So without further ado, I'll let our panelists get settled and we can get the discussion going. So Alice, we have a spot for you um, where I'm standing over here. Good morning, everyone. Certainly an exciting time to be involved in biotech in Los Angeles. And So um, I thought probably the best the starting place would be to, for each of our panelists maybe to just give a very brief uh, background uh, on themselves. Uh, I'm happy to do the same and then we can go through some of the questions uh, that we've prepared. Sure, yeah, I can start. Uh, so my name is Ari Lipman. Uh, I've been in the biotech startup space in Los Angeles, Southern California for about 10 years, product of UCLA. Um, Initially was part of Momentum Biosciences, which is an incubator here in Culver City, uh, then joined a couple different startups after that, and uh, now board member at Lab Launch, and we've also just recently started a uh, biomanufacturing and synthetic biology accelerator here in LA called BioBuilt, uh, which is one of the sponsors of this program, and uh, looking forward to a lively discussion today. Uh, Amir Nyberg, uh, UCLA Technology Development Group. We are uh, responsible for uh, all the inter intellectual property coming out of UCLA. No, sir. Okay. I am uh, responsible for all the intellectual property coming out of UCLA, everything from identifying the IP, giving it the uh, legal packaging, and uh, then marketing uh, 
and partnering over it. Uh, I arrived to UCLA only 10 months ago uh, and trying to uh, work hard to create a new uh, and vibrant ecosystem here. Uh, Hi, my name is Andrew Bartinsky. I'm a PhD from USC. Hopefully you guys don't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> uh, great, someone else is from USC as well. Um, and uh, I recently founded a biotech company focused on medical devices for the eye. Um, and so right now we are kind of in the early preclinical stages um, and happy to talk about what's going on in Los Angeles. Carlos Gutierrez with Larte Institute. Uh, Larta is a 25-year-old organization involved in supporting entrepreneurs, science-based entrepreneurs, but uh, for the past 12 years have been working with the National Institutes of Health on uh, developing and architecting a national scale commercialization program for the agency. And I'm Alice Jacobs. I'm a medical doctor by training. I uh, started my first company when I was in medical school. Uh, I now serve as an investor and advisor to companies all over the country. Um, but being a third generation Los Angelino, I'm very committed to LA and building out more of the ecosystem here in life sciences, um, exploring things like setting up incubator space, sources of capital, trying to help de-risk all the great work that's going on here because in my survey of UCLA and other institutions, there's some really brilliant, brilliant people doing fantastic things here and I'd like to figure out how we keep them here. So um, with that, um, we've got some questions for the moderators, um, uh, for the panelists actually, and um, sort of happy to take, take them through and let's see where it leads. So um, basically, and this may be a bit adaptive because not everyone in here is actually putting capital to work, so maybe it's more about your experience of working with investors uh, or engaging with investors currently. Um, and, and maybe I can speak a little bit about the investing piece as well. Um, because I think one of the questions is, you know, thinking about investment stage, um, industry area, investment size. If you look at the LA landscape, what are the options available to us right now that, that you're familiar with? Um, because I think a lot of the concern is a lot of the capital has to come from the north um, and that this isn't on the beaten path for investors. And so we'd just love to actually get each of your thoughts on what's available here in LA, and I'm happy to add in my, my thoughts as well. So Ari, why don't you? Sure, yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I'll say is that uh, the distance between San Francisco and LA isn't actually that great. Um, and I think, I think it's kind of up to us in LA to some degree to dispel the myth that investors won't come down or there aren't good investors here locally. Um, you know, I personally know many VCs that would love a, a chance to come to LA and go hang out in Venice Beach and have a nice meeting in the sun. Yes. Um, so we have that, we have a serious draw here. So I think that's something that's really exciting. So um, it's true, of course, if you think about kind of per, per capita and density, it's a little more challenging here, but we're lucky because we live in a fantastic environment with, uh, you know, that people want to visit. So I think there is, uh, investors are willing to come down and uh, you know, take meetings with companies here. So that's actually a, a positive thing, I'd say. Uh, I, what I found is that we have a very vibrant uh, angel co investment community. Um, and definitely, you know, San Francisco is just an hour flight away. It's not that big of a deal. And there's really nothing in the world that can compete with the concentration of, of capital over there. Uh, but uh, we're trying to, uh, and quite successfully, bring them here and look into investment opportunities. Uh, and, and it's happening more and more. Yeah. Um, I would echo what the previous panelists said about there being a vibrant angel community in Los Angeles. Um, I currently have A-list status from Southwest, so flights to San Francisco are not uncommon and not difficult. Um, I think Los Angeles does have a history of entrepreneurship. Um, maybe it's been mainly focused in media and film, but I think there are people who are interested in kind of building new things. Um, and so by accessing those groups, I think you can, there's some education that's necessary to get them interested in biotech. Um, but I think the capital is there if you're willing to put in the time to, to connect with those people. Uh, my, my perspective will probably be a little bit from non-dilutive funding side since we work a lot with, with uh, companies that are funded by uh, Small Business Innovation Research Program, SBIR. So uh, we look at, at uh, equipping companies to access that kind of funding early on in their development both phase one, phase two, phase two B. 
I think also here in the region in terms of uh, private capital, uh, just sort of critical mass is probably what's also going to be attractive for, for an investor, given the geographic dispersion, right, that we see here, having pockets of critical mass um, will also be attractive, I think as Ari mentioned before, in addition, all the other sort of, you know, weather benefits and you know, other side, side things here in Southern California. Yeah, and um, the other exciting news is we're also starting to see some groups that are here in LA that are actually focused on life sciences investing, two of which we were trying to get on the panel, and it, it, it's not because of their lack of interest that they're not here. <laughs> They've had some uh, technical difficulties in their own lives, but there's two funds, um, Act One Ventures, um, and Kairos Ventures, both here in LA, um, and both very, very focused on the ecosystem. I mean, Act One, uh, uh, sort of a UCLA offshoot, so certainly for groups here, um, that's certainly a resource to tap into. Uh, and Kairos is new on the scene, um, but uh, you know, especially interested in, in investing in companies that are uh, affiliated with academic institutions here. Um, so the next question is sort of around choice, you know, why LA? What, what attracts you to being, I mean, each of you obviously has a lot to offer. Um, and what makes you uh, excited about being here in LA, um, you know, versus elsewhere? Yeah, I, mean, I can start. Um, I mean, obviously, we're I'm a product of UCLA, um, so the academic institution institutions here are just phenomenal. Um, and when I was finishing up my work uh, in R and D here, there was kind of a situation where do I have to go to Boston? Do I have to go to San Francisco? Do I have to go to San Diego? Um, is there any way that I can stay here and try to um, create this environment, you know, this, this entrepreneurial startup environment in LA? And made the choice to stay here because I really do believe in the region. And again, you know, we'll talk about this, I'm sure all the panelists will mention it, but we have all the right ingredients. Um, and what's really changed in the last three, four years is that I think kind of this sort of entrepreneurial startup culture has really pervaded uh, everybody's minds. Um, at the time when I was finishing up school, it wasn't so high on people's lists. People didn't really want to start startups. But I think that's kind of one really exciting thing that's happened in the last few years is that everybody wants to, being an entrepreneur is actually something that's kind of looked favorably upon and it's exciting to people and that's evidenced by everyone in this room. So I think uh, people want to stay here in LA and start these businesses using the tools that are available to them. So that's part of the reason why I think uh, this region is, is quite exciting. Uh, well, for me, uh, first of all, I have no choice because I work for UCLA, <laughs> so I have to be here. Uh, but, uh, you know, just, just look around at UCLA where we are here. Uh, this is a prime incubator, CNSI, right? There's nothing like this uh, in many regions of, of, the, of the nation. And if you look at UCLA, uh, what's happening in, in Westwood, it's remarkable. We have the best in the West Hospital across the street from engineering, uh, here we have a high throughput screening facility. Uh, we have uh, an animal facility. We have all the ingredients in Westwood uh, to actually launch a successful, a successful startup company, either in medical device or in pharmaceuticals. So that's very exciting. That's a very, very unique setup that uh, we're trying now to um, kind of break the news out there and, and inform people you, have to, you can be here and build up your companies. Uh, just look outside again, outside this conference room, there are so many resources for uh, faculty and students to kind of build their company and, and launch it. Uh, there's no need to travel away other than obviously fundraising. <laughs> Uh, I think as an entrepreneur, it's important to be a little bit uh, contrarian um, and to follow trends early. Um, and so I think that the decision to start a company or, or work in the biotech or tech space in LA is a little bit contrarian. And I think that that gives you a benefit by not following the herd going where everyone's gone before. Um, I think also a lot of the steps that we're seeing now in LA really focusing on becoming a biotech hub um, will help those early companies and early adopters that come here. And so I think that those two factors really put LA in a, in a prime position going forward. Uh, for us, uh, when we look at, lot, we're obviously Los Angelinos as well, so there's a lot of sort of local pride that just comes with it right there. But when, when we looked at Los Angeles, well, it's also ripe for uh, the evolution, for us to have a uh, handprint in shaping the development of a biosystems, a bioeconomy here. And, and I'll say this, we, we looked at, when we did our, our, uh, 
our work with NIH, developing a commercialization program and developing methodologies and tools and networks for you know, approximately 100 NIH-funded startups each year for the past 12 years. We stepped back and we said, is there a way we can take this, the same ecosystem we've built for NIH, we've probably cycled through anywhere you know, north of 400 companies that have raised over $800 million of non-dilutive capital and said, can we take those resources and apply them here in the region, right? So it's, it's something that, that obviously is, is a benefit for NIH-funded startups across the U.S. What if we concentrated those resources, those networks here in Los Angeles? And, and that's a little bit what's behind uh, a small pilot program we're doing with LA Biomed uh, out of uh, Harbor UCLA. So I'll, I'll share a little more about that, but that's an experiment in us trying to take the, the, nat the networks, the investment community, uh, strategics, that we've harnessed for a national scale program and redirecting it here in Los Angeles. Because I think there's a lot of great stories that just aren't uncovered, are not featured, don't get the spotlight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, LA Biomed um, is UCLA based um, and they have been very successful in raising funds uh, to develop an incubator uh, in Torrance, um, which is going to be fantastic. Uh, it, they have already broken ground, um, so I think it's about a year and a half, two years from yeah. now. They actually have some space, sort of pre-incubator mm -hmm. space available now, um, uh, which is great, but it's also nice because you can literally walk, uh, you know, stones throw away to the hospital. So that translational aspect is there. So um, that's certainly very encouraging. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that we all are thinking about is Okay, you know, is there a home team advantage? You know, what 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 are what are the advantages of actually staying here? And I think that the contrarian concept is a good point. Um, definitely getting the sense that that VCs from the north are actually excited to come down here and tap into things that they just haven't seen um, and have access to things. I know that through um, Biocom, which is our industry sort of trade organization, that set up an office here. And now they're starting to cycle through um, venture capitalists uh, through their office. And thus far, um, that's actually been a really positive thing. They love meeting with companies here. Um, but I think your potential to actually stand out from the crowd when you're not like company 205 that's coming through um, is a great thing. So um, I, I definitely think that there are um, unique features here. Um, for those of you who are, have tried to raise capital, um, maybe it would be helpful to kind of put a little bit of color on that, what that experience has been like here versus interacting with companies from the north um, and, you know, sort of some of the challenges uh, for, for starting up companies here that, that uh, other potential founders should be mindful of. Yeah, I mean, I can, uh, what I'll say is that I think there's a real opportunity to start courting non-traditional biotech investors. Uh, and, you know, in particular, when you think about uh, Isha's presentation from earlier, seeing uh, people who are really, you know, most of her investors are coming out from outside of the life sciences industry, most of her donors. So, in particular in LA, where we have a lot of capital, um, and a lot of it doesn't know much of anything about biotech or life sciences, I think we have an opportunity to kind of um, sell the vision and talk about these really compelling products to people maybe from the entertainment industry or people who made their money in real estate and, uh, you know, try to um, capitalize on some of that money that is here by uh, talking about some of the really compelling and exciting things we can do. And, you know, if LA can do anything, it can sell itself. So I think that's something that's really positive that we have going for us is we have vision, we can sell these products. So uh, I would encourage entrepreneurs to talk to people outside of the kind of traditional life sciences space and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. So I'd just like to direct everyone to a resource we have in our office. It's called uh, Startup in a Box where we basically help you start your own business. Uh, it's a group of service providers who are willing to do uh, the work pro bono. So they'll help you start up, uh, incorporate a company, go through the process of uh, HR, taxes, uh, and then you can also tap into our network of, of investors that just come up uh, here every once in a while and, and we do uh, a dog and pony show for them to just uh, look at the opportunities coming out of UCLA. Yeah, speaking uh, from the USC side, similarly, there's a lot of resources available. Um, again, I think that for, you know, 
postdocs, grad students, the, the hardest part is kind of finding the exposure to get into the community for these events. Um, and so I'd encourage you to kind of contact either, you know, people outside of your current department or people higher up in the school's administration to see what opportunities they can offer. Um, more broadly in LA, there's a lot of uh, things like LAST, LACI, LACI um, is a very interesting resource that people should consider looking at. Um, and the other kind of hubs that are starting to come online for biotech um, are very helpful in terms of providing those early stage services like Startup in a Box um, and other things such as that. I have not had the pleasure of trying to raise money. So. <laughs> oh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I had a quick question, though. I, I, I know that the, um, there's an LA Bioscience Coalition uh, uh, organization, right? The city's leading it, county as well. And they're looking at, at what are going to be the conditions to enable a thriving, a growing uh, bioeconomy here. And they're looking at things like capital, talent, space, facilities, infrastructure, mentoring. So I'm I'm almost just throwing a question out there a little bit on, on if you were to rank each of those and sort of say, you know, wh where, where should this, where should we be looking at in terms of uh, attacking each of these different areas, you know, in terms of priority, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on what are going to be the core building blocks to achieve, you know, what they want to, uh, their objectives, which came out of a Patel report and came out in 2012, yeah. right? It's five, five years later now. Yeah. Um, and they still, you still want to see the implementation of the recommendations. Well, it, it's a great question. And I actually just returned um, last night from uh, New York and Boston, um, where I was actually meeting with startups. And, um, and in New York, you know, there's been a, a wonderful development period of incubators setting up around the city. and. Um, and it's great because you end up with a focal point for programming and events and allows for friction for people to bump into each other, um, which I think is part of, when you think about accelerating companies, it's actually having them in the traffic and the investors are there and the partners are there. And so what I'm very focused on is trying to think about you know, creating more of those spaces here. I think this is actually probably one of, one of the great options. Uh, and there's a lot of great programming that comes through CNSI. I mean, USC is doing some great things with their accelerator. Um, through the Viterbi School, uh, I know that Caltech has interests uh, in, in this. So, um, so part of it is going to be creating more concentrated space. So, so there's really a couple of things that are needed, I think, in terms of key ingredients. So, because we already have the talent, which is the most important part. So, to start with really smart people with great ideas and vision and boldness and are willing to do the tough work of actually starting businesses. So that part is checked, which is actually the, the key. The second piece is really space to set up your businesses because um, lab space is not uh, the easiest thing to find around here. Although I'm learning there are pockets. There's like a few little spots in Santa Monica. There's some places in Pasadena. So you definitely have to get creative about space. Um, the third one is capital. So the fact that we're starting to see some local institutional sources of capital. Um, you know, I, I know that LA County is interested in supporting groups that want to set up here to put capital to work, um, which is great. Um, and then the fourth piece is talent, right? So particularly around um, management talent, um, there are certainly we're seeing quite a few companies in the digital health space, but you know also certainly pure play bioscience. There's not a ton, there's not a huge bench to draw on. Although I'm finding that it's very, it's an attractive place to bring people to. Um, you know, it's still a more manageable place I think than the Bay Area. I mean, I know we have traffic, but um, I think lifestyle-wise, LA is second to none. So I think our ability to attract talent is. But you don't have quite the stable of, of potential hires. So again, the more that we can help corral people, and that's, again, a view, part of my responsibility is that you know, it, some of it is that we're just dispersed geographically. Um, but uh, we need to focus more on, on these things. I don't know if Ari, you want to comment more on this? Yeah, no, I think you've got the kind of ingredients right. Uh, BioBuilt, our accelerator, is raising money right now, so I will say capital is at top of mind for me. That's kind of my current struggle um, on a daily basis. But again, I think 
uh, we're we're kind of focusing on uh, non-traditional biotech products, um, things that are you know synthetic biology, biomanufacturing stuff like this. So we're really working hard to again educate the market and educate investors here who might not be familiar with life sciences about the potential of these um, products and businesses related to them. So um, you know it, it's definitely a challenge, but I think people here, investors here in LA, are fairly open-minded to new new ideas, and um, I, I think. You know, there's 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 a lot of opportunity here. Again, this keeps coming up, but we're all I think we're kind of at the bottom of the curve, which is exciting. There's a lot of potential ahead, so I think some of these struggles are going to start to sh uh, work themselves out over the coming years. So we're currently fundraising for UCLA Innovation Fund, uh, which will be basically seeding opportunities and building a pipeline for uh, uh, opportunities that would otherwise be uninvestable for uh, traditional VCs. And after having many conversations with them, we know that once we see these opportunities and build a pipeline, they will come. They will come to make those investments. So we actually had a first round for that uh, fund uh, announced, uh, or actually closed um, yesterday, and we're going through those opportunities. So we, we received 100 applications for that. So that's an amazing, within one month, we were able to get 100 applications for the fund. We'll, we'll be able to uh, finance only a handful of them because we're still fundraising. But that's one thing we're doing in order to, uh, to build this ec ecosystem around UCLA. And I think the second thing that we need is a very good and nice su success story. And hopefully we'll have that with Kite Pharma. Uh, UCLA-based, uh, uh, building a new campus in Santa Monica. And hopefully they'll get their drug approved, a new CARTI drug approved uh, later this year. Uh, that will be a very nice success story that will hopefully attract management and people to come here. Yeah, um, the School of Tech is also, we're early stage raising a, a seed slash pre-A round. Um, and I think that the efforts in Los Angeles, um, I think there are a lot of different disparate networks. Um, and so once you get into kind of one group of people, you'll start to get connected with people in the funding circles that they run with. Um, whereas up in the Bay, I think that the network is much more developed, I think in Boston as well, um, where once you sort of start talking to some people, they'll have a much broader sense of where you fit in the ecosystem. Uh, whereas in LA, that might not necessarily be the case yet um, for biotech. Uh, thinking about the talent and location of Los Angeles, um, we're very close to many strategic partners that many people would work with, right? You have people in Thousand Oaks, people down in Irvine and San Diego that are close by. Um, and I think that the talent that's already at those strategics and their uh, interest in new biotech companies um, makes LA a good position to be able to work with them from an early stage. Um, and so I think that that's another advantage of the, the LA location and in terms of finding talent. Um, if you're looking for leadership, I think there are people in those companies that would fit quite well with their merging things in Los Angeles, as well as all the top notch, notch universities that are continuously putting out um, people who are in the earlier stage of their careers that are really interested in kind of high risk, high growth uh, companies. A couple of things that, that we've observed in our, in the, uh, the commercialization program we've run for companies, uh, early stage companies, is they've also been able to, to generate some funding and traction from pa patient advocacy organizations that traditionally would have invested in, in uh, just the research, but now are investing in private, com private companies. Um, impact investors, family offices, we've also seen some of the companies that we're working with, particularly those that are um, lo uh, looking at sort of underserved disease condition areas, uh, that uh, they have a, an affinity for a particular condition. Uh, some companies have uh, generated some success in generating funding from family offices as well. And then, as I mentioned before, you know, I'll be glad to talk to anybody here about non-dilutive funding through the SBIR program as well, or STTR program, uh, both NIH and also NSF. NSF funds uh, quite a lot of uh, bioscience uh, early stage companies also. Um, and you might also want to look at things like, you know, most folks wouldn't think the Department of Defense funds also life sciences and, and, and biomedical research, uh, private companies. So there's also opportunities within DOD uh, for non-dilutive funding via SBIR and other programs. Yeah, I would definitely echo the, the family office approach, um, especially for biotech, where if you're addressing the core focus of what the family office is looking for, you can often find a very good fit there. Um, for those of you who don't know what family offices are, I would recommend reading up on them because they're much harder to find than a traditional VC or angel group may be. Um, and so they can be very helpful, but they're generally not broadcasting their existence. So it's more of we'll find you than you'll find them.
Um, but if you look very hard, you can find ones that are very well aligned with what you're working on. Yeah, so I mean, probably gets to the next question around um, government uh, and current political climate, which is obviously still an emerging topic. Um, and just wondering, I mean, things like SBIR grants that companies are so dependent on, given the current uh, administration, um, changes at FDA, um, how do you think that that impacts startups um, specifically, and does that then make private investors and VCs um, even more critical to launching businesses? Yeah, so SBIRs definitely have a very strong signaling effect to investors. They see that as a high bar of, of scientific uh, review and merit if you're able to get one. Um, we went through the NSF i program, which is run by a program director who also does a lot of SBIR work. Um, and he said that uh, on Capitol Hill, the SBIR program is one of the most popular things that the, any of the institutions do because of its tremendous return on investment. So despite the fact that many government funding agencies are seeing cuts in their funding, um, the SBIR programs uh, feel like they will be relatively robust. And I don't speak for the federal government, so uh, let me just say that right now. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, the, I know that the president's sort of skinny budget had a 20% cut, right, for NIH. But uh, it's, it's not over, right? There, I mean, a lot of uh, folks have said, you know, that, that that first initial budget's pretty much dead on arrival. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of negotiation before we sort of see what the final uh, funding levels are going to be. Um, uh, as Andrew mentioned, obviously, as SBR has, has pretty broad bipartisan support. Um, it's uh, obviously focused on, on early stage, uh, on entrepreneurs, uh, on, on startups, uh, and particularly funding in a lot of red states as well. So um, let's keep that in mind also. Um, so that's, that's also gonna keep it, and I was in, in uh, DC for some Hill meetings about three weeks ago, and, and uh, I see strong support for the program. Uh, 2011, it, it got into, it broiled in, in a little bit of uh, um, uh, bipartisan issues and, and was on the rails, but uh, it's been reauthorized for another five years, so I think it's, it's gonna be fine in terms of SBIR funding. I guess the only thing I'll add is that if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting a company, uh, you know, you're going to have uh, some serious worries and challenges, uh, you know, even on a day to day basis with your team and with your IP and with your trying to, uh, you know, making your freaking product work. So like these government and external challenges, at least at the early stages, you just kind of have to accept that risk to some degree. So um, you're going to be fighting fires literally in your own living room. So. Um, you know, I, I think some of these things you can kind of distance yourself a little bit from and not get too concerned. I would encourage everybody to still just go for it and, uh, you know, don't, don't let um, the current administration hold you back. So um, maybe we can make, turn this to become a little more personal because we've all sort of been through some of these challenges before. Um, maybe if you, if you can share some lessons learned or you know, case study of something that uh, you've been involved with in terms of getting startups launched uh, here in LA that you can share with, with the audience. Yeah, I guess, um, so personally I would say, um, you know, again, I kind of brought this up previously, but uh, this sort of startup fever and entrepreneurship uh, bug that people are catching I think is really fantastic and that's a big change that I've seen in the last five or six years. Um, so. You know, if you're um, getting your master's, if you're working on your PhD, if you're slogging away in the lab, if you're doing a postdoc, um, I, I honestly encourage all of you to just, you know, think about all think about all your options and realize this beautiful network and all these opportunities in LA to help you. So uh, I, you know, my dream would be that there would be a ton of folks here who just want to accost the panel and accost uh, any funders about their ideas and getting things started. Um, you know, one of the challenges I had to overcome as a scientist is that we're, we're natural skeptics and we're all, we're, you know, we kind of oftentimes think the worst of the outcomes of our experiment, experiments and, um, you know, you kind of, to some degree, have to partition that part of your brain and, and start to think about uh, big ideas and big visions and, um, you, know, you know, really keep that optimist part of yourself uh, alive. So, you know, keep, keep the scientist but also keep the optimist. 
um, because I think, you know, there's really just so many opportunities. And I, I had to kind of face that battle with myself when working on my uh, prior startups. I'd like to talk about the advantages of, of, of a team. Uh, you're all very smart, very intelligent, advanced degrees, but it's very hard to do a startup on your own. And if you look at uh, stories of people who made it, they all had a very good team with them, kind of multidisciplinary, you know, one person for science, the other one is taking on the legal and financial aspects. So uh, I think my, my advice, we don't try to do it all on your own. Uh, build your team and, and try to run with it. Uh, but don't be in a hurry to drop out of school, you know. Uh, <laughs> getting, getting your education is, is probably important enough that you can uh, wait with your startup dreams until you graduate. <laughs> yeah, everyone, stay in school, kids. Um, <laughs> we uh, have been really, really overwhelmed by how supportive the community is uh, when you kind of come with an idea and you want to try and turn it into reality. So uh, time and again, you'll be surprised by the people who will agree to meet with you um, and how much time they'll be willing to take out of their busy days, you know, running a division at a large multinational company or someone who's, you know, faculty at a prestigious university whose papers you cited throughout your entire thesis. Um, people are very supportive of the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and it's very exciting to see what you can do if you just are persistent and kind of follow your gut and your uh, technical expertise as you try and bring whatever you're working on out into the world. Um, so it's a lot of fun to kind of be in a space where people are so willing to, to help and work towards the success of, of everyone involved. And help sometimes comes in the, in the form of criticism too, right? Constructive yeah. criticism too. So that's what I would say also to, to Ari's point about resilience and persistence is is if you're going to be sort of in this Brownian motion mix of, of interfacing with other entrepreneurs, peers, uh, large companies, uh, you know, you're, you're, going to get, you're going to get criticism, you're going to get challenged, and, and that's part of the process as well. Yeah, I would, I would definitely jump on that. Um, we've been working on this idea for about a year uh, as a company, um, and it's, you know, you kind of start as this rough stone and you get kind of chiseled away into a different shape. And so you have to be willing to adapt to kind of both the market and the advice that you get from the people that you are working with. Um, if you want to be successful, you can't just be rigid and inflexible. Yeah, and I really like the concept of trying to tap into the strengths of what LA has to offer. Um, in terms of the media component, in terms of the new technologies that are getting developed. Um, I think it can create an angle for how you're thinking about businesses um, that you couldn't get elsewhere. Uh, I had the privilege a few nights ago to sit down with um, you know, one of the great contributors to technology uh, alive. Um, and we were talking about how you know, thinking about things like artificial intelligence, um, AR and VR, and all these sort of new technology angles that we should really be thinking about everything we do from that angle. Like, why wouldn't you want to use those tools for anything, even if it's discovering a drug or enhancing a device? Why wouldn't you want to take um, those technologies and use that filter? Um, it's going to improve your positioning, sure, but I actually think it, you're, it's going to improve your outcome. And a lot of those experts are, are actually here. And so the more that we can have some sort of cross-pollination, I think, with some of the areas where LA actually does have strengths, um, we're going to come out of the gate with better and more differentiated technologies. Um, I think so. So no matter what you're working on or thinking about, I think if you can think about bridging and using those tools in your arsenal, you're going to come out ahead. Um, and so uh, I, I think it's really great. You know, we, we've been talking a lot, anyone in this audience who's actually thinking about companies, um, might be a good moment actually to turn it over for some questions, because um, it's, it's a rare event to get, um, this is a, a very diverse panel. Um, and I think if there's any problem you're trying to solve right now in real time, you probably have someone here in this group that could probably help you sort it out. Um, so I thought it might actually be useful um, to take a moment if people have questions about uh, making it in LA. Um, 
this might be a good chance to, to, to do that. By the way, Alice, you can name drop who you had dinner with. <laughs> you can name drop. You're allowed to name drop. Eric Schmidt. Oh, okay. For the executive cool. chairman of Google, for those of you who, who is completely AI obsessed, as am I. I am. Uh, I've. I may, I don't know. It, it. Having just spent the last week um, looking at a lot of companies that are using AI um, in so many different avenues. Um, I don't know if I'm just drinking the Kool-Aid at this point, but I, I'm very intrigued, very, very intrigued. So Biocom is actually looking at that question. Biocom that just opened an office here in LA, and they uh, are working hard. So what they identified is that actually there is no local reporter in, the, in our region who is dealing with, with biotech or pharmaceuticals. So now they're trying to build that talent, because without local uh, uh, reporters to cover that, those areas, it will, will never be picked up by uh, national media. So they are working on that. I can say, tell you, in my group, uh, we are uh, starting this Monday, we hired a marketing manager that will help you know, tell the world the tremendous job uh, work done here in, in, in UCLA. Uh, and there's another group that's about to be launched in about two weeks, who's going to look into Southern California as the next hub for innovation uh, that may replace and supersede uh, the Bay Area. So, so there are dif different efforts all going on just in order to, to address this issue. What, uh, if I could join on that, Amir. What, one of the things, you know, uh, two thoughts. One is, is obviously there has to be some meat there to the story, right? If you're going to be telling a, a story, there has to be some meat there. And, and I think we do have enough, uh, there is enough meat there. But it, I'm, I'm always kind of astonished in a city that has become sort of the, the beacon for storytelling. And, and shaping stories and telling stories in a compelling way, Hollywood, right? Um, we haven't harnessed that more and, and pointed it in the direction of, of industries like bioeconomy, biosciences. Um, so that's just a statement I'll throw out there that I think is, is a, a ripe opportunity. The talent is here, the storytelling talent is here, um, and the content is here. I think just connecting those two uh, will, will go a long way in, in you know, sharing that, that story in a compelling way that generates that interest from the outside, the aha that says, oh yeah, I should check it out and see what's going on there. Yeah, I think uh, going back to what Amir said, um, I think that the, the show of past success uh, is a strong attractor for bringing the capital down here. Um, and so I think that it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. And so I think we're starting to build the evidence that there is a, a, a significant amount of good ideas coming out of LA. Um, but I think that that kind of reinforces itself um, as deal flow comes out of LA that will bring more investors down. And so investors will generally claim to be, you know, on the cutting edge and, and looking for every new thing. But a lot of groups um, follow the herd. Um, and so once we kind of get some good successes and show that the things that people are working on down here are very interesting, um, I think that that starts the viral loop for LA. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that, uh, you know, everybody work on your network building. And I would hope that in a room like this, each individual person would know at least 10 other people or something or five or 10 other people. And we're all here and we're all open to share business cards and connect with you on LinkedIn and follow you on Twitter and so on and so forth. So I think as that network builds, you know, that one of those links becomes a reporter and a blogger and a person doing a podcast. And this kind of just, again, reaches this critical mass. So um, connect with people as much as you can. That's my only advice. I had a question. Um, I think, Amir, you brought up earlier that there's a lot more opportunity nowadays to approach non-traditional investors to raise money for an idea. I was wondering if anybody on the panel had any sort of advice for how to approach really wealthy people with, uh, to try to get their money for an idea. Uh, don't be weird. Um, so, <laughs> so that's the, that's the general advice. And so the, the way to not be weird, um, get a warm introduction. So build your network. Um, maybe you don't know wealthy people now, maybe you do. Um, go to places and meet people, become a personality, get to know the people in your community, know people who know people. Um, that's the first step. So if you're just cold calling, cold emailing, hey, I have the best new idea, that's probably not going to be as attractive as like, oh, your friend Jim, who you play golf with all the time, is a friend of mine. Um, and so I would say build your network is the best way to get into those circles. Uh, and be respectful of people's time. And if they, they give you a no, that's fine. There's, there's other people you can talk to. 
Yeah, the only other thing I would add is uh, do your research on the person as much as you can. It's, it's easy these days. And uh, secondarily to that is um, kind of speak their language as best you can too. You know, if they're made, they made all their money in real estate. So think about that industry and how they look at deals and how, um, for example, how they, you know, how they look at investments and try to um, position your project in that framework. Um, and, you know, again, explain this kind of very, maybe very foreign science and technology to them in a way they can understand as best you can. The, what I've seen uh, also is, is an effective strategy is don't ask for money first. Seek information, right? They always start to say that, you know, if you just ask for advice and feedback, you'll get, you'll get that and you may get money, right? But if you sort of do the reverse, you, you probably won't get money and then that'll just be the wall right there and it stops. But if you just come from a, a perspective of getting honest critique, feedback, input, uh, that's usually kind of a non-threatening way uh, that then might open the door for a second meeting and some more additional curiosity that starts from that. Yeah, and these are relationships that you're hoping to build over the course of years. Um, you're not gonna close your funding round in 30 days. So, you know, you get to talk to someone, you kind of find out what they're interested in. If you overlap, you kind of keep that relationship going and then maybe a year from now they'll write you a check. Um, and so that's, a more typical, I would say, flow than this person you meet for the first time just throwing a big you know, gob of money at you. Um, I was wondering what you think sets the, the tone for the culture of a biotech environment. Because um, I think we can agree that, you know, Boston, San Francisco, North Carolina, LA, New York, all have a different feel with respect to the biotech environment, which is different from just how they feel as cities. Do you think it's part of, it's because of the universities that are there? Or do you think it's because of the huge biotech companies that made it in those places? Depends on the region. Yeah. So, like, if you look at Boston, um, MIT has just really been fantastic in creating resources for entrepreneurs. Um, their center, there's a center for innovation, I and mean, there's just a lot that's going on um, in, in Kendall Square. Um, in New York, you're definitely seeing, um, you know, having so many large pharmas within an hour of the city, you're seeing a lot more emphasis, I think, from partnerships with pharma. Um, I can't speak as much to North Carolina. I mean, in the Bay Area, I mean, there's just sort of a, a general momentum, although it's interesting because I think trends in the last few years, there's probably been a lot more biotech investing going on in Boston than in the Bay Area, although now I sense that that's evolving. Um, but, you know, part of it is also just the way some of the institutions, the companies have set themselves up. So if you look at a company like Genentech, um, and I think there was an article actually written about this in the LA Times of, what happened, you know, we have Amgen, the Bay Area has Genentech, why is there not a hub around Amgen? Right. Um, and part of it might be historical that Genentech really set up around an institution where they could have, you know, fresh talent and, um, and they were really focused on creating a bridge with acad academia. Um, whereas Amgen was more walled off and wanting to be somewhere that was an inspiring place for management to live, um, but were less focused necessarily on um, creating the sort of next generation of, of technologies. I guess I'll, I'll add one thing. Um, so I, I will say, I think you're right. I think pharma and biotech, well, big pharma definitely does not define the culture in LA. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's Maybe there's someone here from Big Pharma, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, anyone from Big Pharma? Anyone? <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> so, uh, so if we think this is a snapshot of the culture uh, of innovation in biotech in LA, then you know, for better or worse, Amgen is you know an hour and a half away up the road. So, and, you know, of course we have Kite Pharma, but no one from Kite Pharma here. So, I think the academic institutions in particular are defining the sort of innovation ecosystem, um, and the startup entrepreneurs uh, in the audience as well. So. Um, yeah, that's kind of my take on it. Yeah, LA is definitely, it's a, there's a startup culture here, I think, that we can draft from. I, I think that's most compelling and, and incredible academic institutions. Hi, um, good morning. 
I'm probably one of the older uh, person in this room. So I'm going to ask you a very non-traditional question. Um, I'm very interested in people's stories. So I was going to ask the panels, what is the defining moment in your life or any um, experiences that you had that made you decide to become, you know, start a company or become an entrepreneur in your life? I could start. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was toiling away in a lab in, at UCLA. <laughs> Just one more Western blot that didn't work. Uh, that last freaking Western blot. Um, no. Um, that, I mean, honestly, it was being in the lab and uh, just seeing like the the PhD path and the postdoc path ahead of me. And uh, but it really was uh, a, a kind of visionary faculty member at UCLA coming to me and saying, "Hey, we're starting a company. Do you want to be part of it?" So that was sort of the defining moment that shifted me away from academia and into, you know, I was still doing research, but gradually towards business and entrepreneurship. So it was sort of a visionary uh, a faculty member here who really kind of believed in me as uh, having that kind of spirit and wanting to escape the lab. So um, for me, that was my moment. So I, I never did actually work in a startup company per se, I have to say. So uh, I just uh, found myself before uh, uh, the bubble burst in 2000, uh, looking for a job in an internet company, ended up working for a technology transfer company, um, which I loved and made it my career. So it really was very, could have taken another turn and worked for an internet solver company and then the bubble burst and who knows where will my career take me. But very, uh, very co coincidental. Uh, so my grandfather was a professor of psychology. My dad is a professor of physics. My uncle is a professor of uh, neurosurgery. So like you had to go to grad school. Um, so I went to grad school and I was getting through my PhD and kind of saw the track of what was next. Um, and it was either go like deeper and deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and become the world's expert in one thing, um, or try and do something else. So I kind of started looking around USC and seeing what was going on. Um, and then my co-founder kind of came to me one day and was like, Hey, we should apply for this competition, whatever they, you know, they help you with writing a business plan and maybe, you know, the stuff that we're working on, we could try and, and submit it in there. Um, and so we did that and got selected, and kind of that was the turning point. And so it went from, you know, just keep on going down and becoming more and more exp experienced in one area to now what's really exciting is trying to bring something out into the world that many people will see. Um, and so I think that that was kind of the shift in, in like, life view, I guess, that kind of got me into to, to entrepreneurship was that ability to impact a lot of people's lives um, in a meaningful way. So I came from a sort of non-traditional angle as well, as a, a sort of similar to sort of mirror story. During the dot-com boom, I was working for a, a startup. Um, it was a, actually an entertainment-based startup, completely different field, out of an incubator called Idea Lab in Pasadena. And so it raised, you know, about, you know, 36, 40 million dollars in venture funding, Kleiner Perkins, yada, yada, and then the bubble burst. And then, uh, you know, it went from like 180 people down to 10. And then in the last wave, I was let go. And uh, experienced that and then kind of thought about what I was going to do next. And then Larda Institute sort of came on the, on the radar for me. And at the time, I thought it was an interesting mix of uh, the hard sciences, which was, I was really attracted to, uh, but also uh, the intersection of, of, of industry, uh, startups, and government. At the time, we were managing a commercialization seed fund, or LARDA was, for the state of California. So I thought those three things were, were compelling for me, um, and, uh, and been there for about you know, 15 years since. I, um, I was on the research path myself. I um, thought I was actually going to do an MD, PhD, because one graduate degree wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> I started working in the lab when I was 16 years old, and. Uh, I really knew nothing else. Um, and I sort of wanted to go to medical school, and I actually made the mistake of saying in my, ex in my essay that I was never going to practice medicine. Um, I was only going to school to learn disease better, which basically meant, please haze me. It was made, <laughs> made for an interesting time. Um, but when I was in medical school, I actually lost a patient on my watch um, to a staph infection. Um, and I was a young guy who came in for routine surgery 
and we were working him up to be discharged when he spiked a fever. And so even though, you know, I was on this path, I had picked my lab, I knew where it was going, and everything had been started. I thought, wow, you know, I spent all this time in the research lab, and we use these tools, you know, to, 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 for all of these research projects, and why aren't we using these tools in the hospital? It just seemed like this shocking thing. And um, so for me, I just immediately, like, switched in a totally different direction and decided to start a company to test hospital infections and bring these technologies into hospitals, which we did. Um, but sometimes you just have to kind of follow, uh, you know, your experiences and what moves you um, because the best way to have an impact is to really do something that is, comes from within. Um, and that's been a very, very fulfilling road. So I really recommend, you know, of the experiences you have, the exposures you have in your own life, your own experiences, friends or family who have you know, health conditions and other things, let, let that motivate you um, because it will get you to where you need to go. Um, that's very, very motivating. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I have a question about hiring uh, for life sciences in Los Angeles. So I run a small early stage biotech company and besides funding, and Yari knows this, it is incredibly difficult to hire for lab technicians, computational scientists in Los Angeles. Can you guys give us some ideas, websites, like where do you hire and some tips and tricks? Craigslist. <laughs> uh, I think for, for techs, uh, Craigslist is actually a good place to go. Um, the company that I worked at for a while in the Bay um, had success there and it seems like it would work here as well. I've been interviewing for positions uh, for the last uh, eight months or so. It's incredibly challenging. Uh, we found one good resource, uh, a website called uh, the Dropout Club, which are basically PhD students that don't want to continue in academia. Awesome. And received, <laughs> yeah, and received a whole bunch of good CVs from there. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't actually done any hiring in a, a few years, but uh, at the time, um, you know, we, I think one of the things is you're, you know, you, I'm sure you're aware of this, but you're going to have to do some training. Um, it's really hard to fill that specific niche in a perfect way. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I'm coming from the startup arena where it's like you need some flexibility. They've got to be someone willing to learn, willing to kind of do whatever it takes. So uh, a lot of times we would hire people who didn't match the job description. Um, maybe they matched at 50%, but flex flexibility in hiring for your roles, of course, is, is important. Other answers other than Craigslist. Um, if you, we've had good success uh, contacting the department chairs of every university in the area. Um, and so if you can get on their listservs, you'll at least get applicants from students that way. Um, uh, SoCal Bio, I think, also has a listserv that they use, which could be useful. Yeah, I mean, I've done most of my hiring in Boston, but when we were doing hiring, it was it was interesting because ultimately, universities, you're getting the people who at least have the educational background that you need. Um, in a perfect world, you'd have someone who had the educational background and a couple of years of industry experience because the translational piece takes some training. Um, in a research setting, you might go in and do you know, seven experiments in a weekend, but in a product development setting, if you haven't documented every step of the way, you may have actually wasted your whole weekend. So getting people over that hump, um, there's a learning curve. Um, but people, you know, smart people, you can certainly train them and coach them and, and get them there. Um, the other place, which is a bit opportunistic, but is to look at, place, at companies, obviously, that have some of the core functions of what you're looking for, um, you know, and sort of tap in. Uh, but I guess that's a bit opportunistic. But you know, within an hour, two hours, or even in the Bay Area, I think attracting people here, um, I think it's a great place to live. So I think that there is that approach as well. I had another question about hiring. Um, in your hiring experience, what percentage are people from within LA, and how much, and what percentage are people you've attracted from outside? So my two, oh, actually three recent hires are all coming outside of LA. Uh, we haven't hired uh, in LA yet, but the company I was at previously in the Bay Area, we would primarily hire local. 
I would say about 50-50. Um, a lot of people more just kind of regionally. We'll have people from Orange County, San Diego, uh, east of, you know, the whole Southern California area. Um, and that actually covers a lot of, you know, that's just a massive population. So there's definitely resources, you know, if you think about uh, Ontario and Redlands. And yeah, the, the region has a lot of talent. Um, I have uh, similar questions. So um, actually, I'm trying to. Uh, um, um, I, I'm actually from the uh, bioinformatics department, so uh, uh, more focused on the computational part. So uh, I feel like uh, I want to form my uh, my team. So uh, I, I wish I could get uh, partners from uh, area uh, like uh, therapeutics, clinical, and also uh, finance. Um, so, but I feel like uh, it's a little bit hard for the graduate student to find those people, it's, it's, uh, especially with uh, um, industry uh, experience. So um, I'm not sure uh, what would be a, a good way to uh, outreach to your uh, founder, co-founders and your uh, partners. Um, thanks. I would say talk to everybody about your idea. That's my primary advice, you know, literally every, when you're, and when everyone's drinking coffee out there, talk to everybody about your idea uh, and see, you know, what sort of connections you can make that Let's way. file a patent first. Oh, right, right. right. <laughs> well, you know, you don't have to get too specific, <laughs> I would hope. I hope they can't steal your idea after one sentence. So, uh, but yeah, again, so talk, talk to everyone about your idea and see what sort of things bite because right now your definition of a, what your partner might look like is, is going to be very fluid. Um, and you just need to find, you know, find a compatriot who says, that's an awesome idea, let's have coffee, let's talk more about it. So um, it's going to events like this, it's talking to people in your lab or the next door lab or whatever, so just get out there and talk about your idea. Um, no part of it is going to be easy, um, and if you're looking for people who are not like you, go places you wouldn't go. Um, so if you're looking for business people, don't necessarily look for them at you know, science-oriented events go to something in the business school. If you're looking for someone who has, uh, you know, if you have a computational background and you're looking for someone in therapeutics, try and find, so try and, like, draw up that person in your mind and think about places they would go and try and have yourself intersect with those places. Um, yeah, I think there are many mixers and competitions where people are just trying to get together and build the teams in order to apply for those competitions. So, so just go to these events where they announce and launch the, launch the competitions and have a mixture around it, and then you'll mingle with, with people who have similar desires. I have a, I have a question. Um, I've been hearing a lot about trying to start, obviously, a good biotech sector out here in a community in the Los Angeles. What? You know, knowing that there's already biotech sector down in San Diego and already one in Irvine, California, Orange County, do you see the competition of resources going all the way across? And what's LA County differentiating itself to the other two counties that are close in proximity versus, you know, Silicon Valley is pretty scarce out and Boston's pretty scarce out. What is uh, LA County doing to differentiate, especially when coming to recruiting, um, recruiting folks? You know. There's going to be a strong competition between there as well. Yeah, I would go back to quality of life in Los Angeles. Um, so it, it largely probably will vary company by company, the culture that you're looking to build. Um, and I think that in competing with San Diego and Orange County, it's, it's largely going to be the type of people that you're looking for. Um, and if you can sell them on that, those will be the differences. Um, and just on a specific like competition basis, I don't think that necessarily having these other biotech hubs nearby is a detriment to Los Angeles. I think that it just provides much more opportunity for potential collaborations or you know leveraging those resources that they've already developed down there, um, just down the five or the four or five. Yeah, and I would definitely add it's definitely not a zero sum game. I mean, we are all looking at this kind of regionally. We want to grow all of Southern California, um, and so I don't see see it as much of a competition because if you, I mean, if you look at the curves of well, growth in number of biotech companies, growth of open positions, growth of graduates coming out of all of our universities, these are all kind of upward moving curves. So I think there's room for everybody to grow, kind of uh, hopefully synergistically. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I think the more we can think about Southern California as one region that's dependent on, it, on 
that the various counties are dependent on each other, um, the better off. I mean, I, I go down to San Diego pretty frequently, and there's certainly programming to tap into there, too, um, that can be helpful to, to entrepreneurs here. Thank you for having us.